Well, hello everybody and welcome to another Tech and Talk. Uh, I'm starting kicking, this is the second in the series, uh, talks with people who have interesting ideas and new innovations coming out in the cloud native, cloud Kubernetes containerized space that we are living and breathing in these days. And a good friend of mine, Chris Nova, at Kube, not KubeCon, at GopherCon, um, last week open sourced a very interesting project that she's going to talk to us about. Um, it's called KubiCorn, or some sort of variation on the unicorn name. And um, it's supposed to solve some really interesting Kubernetes infrastructure management um, issues. And since I wasn't at GopherCon, I was really excited to get her to come on and give us a talk about it. Um, the format for this um, is we'll let um, Chris do the deep dive, the talk, the demo, all the cool stuff. We'll see every, all the demos do their wonderful things. And then we'll do Q&A afterwards live. So if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat and set them up. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to let Chris introduce herself and do the deep dive, and we will get rolling here. So thanks, Chris. Awesome. Well, good to see you again, Diane, and everyone else joining. Um, so Cubicorn, or Cubic O-R-N, as I like to call it, um, is this new tool that I've been wanting to write for quite some time, probably six or seven months. And I finally got some downtime and enough free Saturdays and was able to put this together. Um, I think the high level sort of elevator pitch of what, what it does is it's, it's aimed at solving the infrastructure problem the way I see it in Kubernetes. And I know not everybody sees it the same way I do, but this tool really makes me really happy and addresses some of the things that, that I noticed that I was struggling with that were, that were kind of frustrating me. So hopefully we can talk a little bit more and go into detail of what it is, what it solves, and why I made the technical decisions I made. Um, and I think I would, would want to spend just a couple of moments before we really jump in. Um, this is in a very similar space as the COPS projects that I'm a maintainer of. And I want to just be very clear that I absolutely love and respect COPS. And COPS will always be in like a special place in my heart. And this is not intended to replace that but rather to experiment in the name of research and development, um, some, some patterns that I'm working on and some patterns that I've been wanting to see in the code base. Um, hopefully that can get backported into COPS and we can come together in the future. Um, I think it's also important to note that a lot of what this tool does is a direct reflection of a book that I'm writing right now for O'Reilly on cloud native infrastructure. And some of the patterns that we talk about in the book are directly implemented here in this tool. So is this ready for production? No. Uh, will it be ready for production? I don't know, maybe one day, but it's mostly here and in this space to demonstrate how to uh, solve infrastructure according to these patterns the way that I wanted to prescribe it to myself and there in the community. So let's look at the, uh, the GitHub repo. Can you guys see this okay? Zoom in one. Yep, looks perfect. Okay. Uh, so the, the first thing you'll notice is the lack of the PKG directory over here on the left. And the reason for that is because I wanted to keep this tool very flat. Um, every one of the, the Go packages here on the left, one to two nested packages, if that at all, and I really don't ever intend for them to grow any deeper. Um, and then if you look, there's one main.go file. Um, the whole reason for this setup is so that this program is go gettable. So you can just type go get github.com chrisnova cubicorn cubic ORN, and uh, it'll download the tool and compile it using whatever version of Go you're running and spit out a binary for you. Uh, the, the, the message of this tool is, is I want it to be simple. I really want a user to be able to walk up to this code base and quickly understand what's going on and quickly be able to make meaningful contributions to the project and, and see how this stuff works. Um, one of the things I talked about at GopherCon was this, this beautiful mapper that COPS has where we take this concept of an API and then we, we eventually map that to some set of resources. And here in, in Cubicorn, you can see in the cloud directory, um, we have these very simple maps for each one of the cloud providers that we're working on. Um, 
And we'll go into more detail later as we go and actually look at the implementation. Um, but the, the thing I wanted to say was, how is Cubicorn different? Uh, it uses CubeADM to bootstrap, to bootstrap our clusters. And if you go and you actually run, like actually, I think if I run this right now, CubeADM, I think it says somewhere in here, CubeADM is beta, do not use it for protection clusters. And this is the core of Cubicorn. So uh, you know, bear that in mind if you do decide to start poking around at this tool today. Um, but I really think CubeADM is, is ready. I mean, every time I've, I've used it, uh, it's worked well for me. And it took you know, an hour or two of research and development to kind of figure out the nuances with getting my cluster up and running just right. But once it's there, I mean, it, it's rock solid. So I just I thought it was a good idea, and granted I am a bit crazy um, to go ahead and build out an infrastructure deployment tool on top of Cubeadm, so that I can start using Cubeadm more and start exercising it as a tool. I mean the only way that we're really going to ever get to a point where we're trusting it and people are confident using it is if people start using it. So this is like my way of convincing people it's okay to take that first step and to start um, running clusters with it, regardless of if they're quote unquote, ready for production anyway. And I mean, this is Kubernetes. We've, we're always ready for production, right? Um, so if we go and we actually look at the code, I'm gonna move over to my IDE here. So I hope you guys can, can see this because we're actually gonna look at some Go code today, which is gonna be super exciting. Um, this is the repo that we were just looking at in GitHub. And we use the, uh, the Cobra command library. Thank you, Steve. It's a fabulous library. I love it. Um, to mock out all of our all of our commands. And if we look at each one of those, we have adopt, which is this idea that's not coded that you will be able to walk up to a Kubernetes cluster running in a cloud and audit the cloud interactively through your command line and effectively take ownership of that cluster and begin managing it with Cubicorn. This is one of the patterns that I really want to push for. Um, is this sense of being able to audit infrastructure and reason about it and come up with this um, this concept of it that is represented in the form of the API that we will look at in just a second. Um, apply, which is a very simple idea, but extremely complex under the covers, that says, uh, tell me an intended state, I'll go audit the, the infrastructure and detect its actual state, and then I will reconcile those two states together, thus uh, making some change in infrastructure land. So probably the easiest way to think of apply is I have nothing running. I want to have a cluster that looks like this. I run apply. Apply audits the infrastructure and says, oh, hey, nothing's running. I better create all the things. And then it'll actually go and go through and model out those resources and apply them. And really, you can think of each one of these resources getting applied as an HTTP request to some clouds API. So if we're running in Azure, it would just be an HTTP request. If we're running in Amazon, it would be the same thing. Um, this concept of create, and this is this is what I kind of feel is one of the more powerful things that really makes Cubicorn unique is we have these things called profiles defined here in the profiles directory. And if you write Go, you're already kind of like jaw dropped because you, you see what this is. This is a, a struct literal that defines a Kubernetes cluster in Go, which is freaking gorgeous. Um, and create, we'll take one of these struct literals that we just looked at, and we'll drop it off in a state store. So right now we have under bar state on your local file system that it will create um, as the only type of state store we currently support, because again, this thing is like three weeks old. But ultimately, we want to be able to have state stores in GitHub. We want to be able to use um, state stores like Azure Blob Storage or Amazon S3, where we can just store a simple YAML file. And if you actually go and you look at an example of one of these cluster YAMLs, it's a YAML representation of that struct literal we just looked at. Um, but the good thing here is it actually vendors in Kubernetes API machinery. So if you've interacted with a Kubernetes object before, it's the same thing, but it represents infrastructure instead of some application layer um, item. So create will actually create one of these things according to these profiles. If you go and look at the README and profiles, you'll notice that 
it says, can I add one to the repo? And I'm like, yeah, check it out. We want, I want this directory of profiles to grow and to have all of these different crazy ways of experimenting with this tool and probably breaking the tool and experimenting with Kubernetes and pu pushing the boundaries in all these different ways. So I, in a perfect world, people would be pull requesting these profiles with a little bit of documentation on, on their specific one and why it's important and why it matters. Hold on, I just lost um, my sound here. Can somebody I, confirm that I, I'm still broadcasting? Yep, I can still hear you, you're still broadcasting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully this directory will grow. I will continue to add profiles and I encourage others to experiment and try to add their own. Um, and we will go from there. So that's create. Um, we look at delete, it is the opposite of apply. It says, let me go and audit the infrastructure. And then if anything exists, I know I need to send another one of those HTTP requests and remove it. Um, and env is not a command, it's just shared environment code. Git config is a way of taking an existing cluster and its configuration, which stores information about, let's look at one of these. Um, it'll actually have SSH information in here. So it'll have your public key. This is okay to look at. I'm, it's called public for a reason, no secrets here. Um, and a path to where it was on my file system as well as its fingerprint and the user to bootstrap the cluster. And it'll actually SSH into the cluster, look for uh, the cube, config and then pull it down to your local file system and write it out so that as a user you can just say oh i want to start interacting with this, this this cluster and i know the name of it and go get my config um, image.go this is another one of the things that i think really makes cubicore and unique uh, this it does not work today but ultimately the plan is to be able to bundle up one of these yaml files on the left with all of the yaml representation um, of Kubernetes level objects and possibly etcd backups still figuring out what that's going to look like and if we want to borrow existing tooling somewhere but the uh, the ultimate goal is to be able to take a snapshot of your infrastructure and your Kubernetes application layer bundle all of that up into some sort of compressed uh, file for today I'm rationalizing that as probably just a tarball and and ship that around um, the reason that I want to be able to do that is so that I can say, hey, here's my snapshot of my cluster, and it's just a bunch of text, and I can put that in a GitHub repository, I can send that over in Slack, I can stick it in an email, and if somebody wants to run uh, my same cluster, they could just come up here at the top and say, oh, you know, I work for Microsoft, I want to run this in Azure, and you, you rename that to Azure, and then you can run it, and it's a really great way to share infrastructure and share application layers. Um, already I've had people hitting me up about how they want to be able to use this for testing and development and staging environments. We have Kubernetes in production, but rebuilding that infrastructure actually takes quite a bit of time and it's quite challenging. Um, so this is designed to offer sort of some operational empathy and say, we got your back, bro. We know you want to run Kubernetes in a different cloud. We're going to make that easy for you. Uh, again, I'm a little bit crazy, but my whole philosophy here is I want to experiment and I want to bring people together. I don't want to pull people apart anymore. So I think by offering this framework that says, hey, com come work with us and bring your little component that plugs into the bigger machine here and we can start working together and running in different clouds, I think is really, it's really powerful. And that's kind of what I believe in at the end of the day. Technology aside, I just want to help bring people together and make the world a better place. Um, going back to our commands, we have this, this one called list that was implemented at GopherCon. Many thanks to all of the wonderful engineers who uh, sat with me and worked with me that day. There was about six of them and I could not have asked for a better turnout. And all this does is it says, give me a state store and I will list all of your clusters. So you can see what actually we have running and what actually we have a concept of. And then, then my personal favorite command in the entire tooling is if you just run Cubicorn, without any arguments, you get this fabulous ASCII unicorn displayed in your terminal, um, as you can see here. And actually has the version number <laughs> inside the unicorn. Uh, and it points to the author's file.
file. And then here on the left, we have uh, the actual Git SHA of the, the recent commit. So we're, we're not versioning or doing releases right now because this thing is broken and it doesn't work. Well, it's not broken, it does work. It's just not like, I'm not ready to release it until we get some more stuff built into it. Um, so as we're developing, bear this in mind, if you plan on contributing to the project that I'll probably always be asking for this value if you, uh, if you hit a bug or if you see something weird or unexpected. Um, and then here on the left, we see all of the, uh, the commands we just went through and talked about. So the other thing that I think is really important to, to bring up here is this bootstrap directory. And again, this is operational, empathetic, uh, or empathy, I should say. Uh, you'll see these shell scripts. And as a sysadmin, I, I mean, I, let's, let's be honest here. Like, I love Bash and I hate Bash at the same time, but it works really well. And as an operator, you can look at it and read it and know exactly what's going on. So if we were to actually look at this, like it's a shell script. This is how we bootstrap Kubernetes. And it's what, 47 lines long and probably could be shorter if I didn't have this huge comment at the top that yells at people and tells them to never ever put templating into this, but just write it in Bash. Um, but this is how we bootstrap Kubernetes with kubeadm. And if we actually go and we look at this, we like add the uh, uh, kubeadm to our AppScape repository. We do an update. We install a handful of tools that are needed. We start Docker and we enable the Docker service. I calculate the public IP address of the machine from this EC2 metadata tool. And I calculate the private IP address of the machine using good old if config. Um, I do a reset so that I know my kubeadm is always idempotent, and I do init. And this is like beautiful. If you've ever tried to bootstrap Kubernetes from the ground up before or read Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the Hard Way, this one command does all that for you. And that is, I, I just that just makes me grin ear to ear every time I see it. Um, I showed this to Kelsey at GopherCon. And he shared this one liner here that's that's great. It's um, adding the Calico tool to our cluster that helps us with networking. And it, I think out of all of them, he said this is the one that just kind of worked out of the box and did everything we wanted to. So round of applause for our friends over at Tigera. Um, then we, this final step here is actually optional, but basically I just move the cube config to the same directory so that I always know where to look for it in the git config command we looked at earlier. And it bootstraps Kubernetes. Um, here, the node is, is even shorter. We, we take a token and a master IP address that are passed in from uh, Cubicorn at runtime, and we say join. And we give it a token, and we point it to the master, and nodes come up, and we get a kubelet running. And poof, a Kubernetes cluster. Hooray. Um, so without further ado, who wants to create a cluster? Because I know I certainly do. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to say create. And actually, just for item potency, actually, no, I don't want to do that. We'll just say create. We'll say cubicorn create. We want to give it a name. So we'll call it tech and talk. And we want to give it a profile, which remember these profiles are these struct literals over here. Um, that just define things for you and give you a starting point. Like, hey, it works. You can start there, and then if you want to start making changes, and maybe you want a different user, or you want the Kubernetes API running on a different port, or you want to use a different CIDR block, you totally can come in here and start tinkering. Um, but we'll just start with a basic one for today. So we'll do profile, uh, we'll run this in AWS, why not? So it'll it'll come back and say congratulations we have made this this YAML file for you and you can edit the file and then um, run Cubicorn apply the name of the cluster and I just got like a ringing in my ear is everything okay everything's fine okay so we can do Cubicorn actually let's just look at this why not so state it's the name of the cluster and then our cluster .yaml um, and it's just, again, YAML representation of that struct we just looked at. You'll notice that we, we named things in a clever way so that we can look them up at runtime later. 
And you'll notice that we're pretty explicit with all of the different values we can define here. Everything from a name to the size of the instance to even which CIDR block each of these instances run in. Um, going all the way to the bottom, we can actually see we define SSH information. Again, if you don't explicitly tell it something, it'll make assumptions that I kind of feel are uh, realistic. So looking for SSH ID RSA.pub, but again, if I wanted to use a different SSH key, I could just come in and change this now. Um, we generated this super secret token at runtime. So when I first released the program, we had this hard coded and now it's being generated with a random hex string and, and that's it. That's all we have. So we can, we can get out of there and we can, um, apply this and all we all right, so we had a slight technical break there, but we're going to restart now, and I'm going to give it back to Chris and take it away again. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, we can we can now go into uh, Emacs. Actually, I had deleted it, so let me recreate it. Um, So we can now go into Emacs and actually look and see what we just created, which was the name of the cluster here and then cluster.yaml. And here you can see we have uh, all of our key value pairs defined. We have our SSH information. We have our, our size um, of the instances we're running and we create all of the, the network information here. As, as well. And this is kind of interesting because each of the masters and the nodes are defined in their own individual network configuration. So as, as a user, you can actually go in and, and define some pretty powerful network configurations and tweak them to your liking. And you can trust that your, your, your nodes and your masters are going to be running independently of each other, but can still route between each other. So now that that's created and we've made our changes or maybe we haven't, we can actually do an apply. So I can do an apply, actually. Let me quickly demonstrate that if a user has no cube config on their system, they can do a cubicorn apply slash the name of their cluster. And I will turn the logs up for folks at home. And we can actually go through and and see what we're what we're creating here so the logger i wrote myself because i'm a bit crazy and i wanted um pretty colors but the the colors actually represent things so every time you see the cyan color you can as a user you know that something happened some action was taken, the system changed in some way um if you've ever heard charity majors talk about her her uh tooling at honeycomb it's this is a very important concept so we, we separate them out from just regular debug information that is just telling a, a software engineer where we are as the code executes. So we can actually go and we can look at these cyan colored uh, log entries and actually see it take place and watch the cluster come to life. So the first thing we do is create this key pair, which is uh, just the, the representation of the SSH key. After that's created, we can create our network VPC. We create an internet gateway so that we can we can map everything out to the public internet. And we start going through this, this model that is indexed together. And if we look at the, uh, the model, it's just a hash map and it's integer indexed and it's just a list of resources. And after, after we define one of these, we increase our integer and this sort of path allows us to uh, to make variables as we create these. And so we can define VPC index is equal to wherever the index is right now, and we can use that later in our code. But it's important to note that this data structure, this integer index hash map, or think of it like a list, if you will, um, is what represents our cluster and the resources we will create. So I really almost wish that this thing failed so that I could demonstrate this really valuable concept of uh, cubicorn being atomic. So because it didn't fail, I can just sort of explain what would happen. Let's pretend that we got to creating the security group. And for some reason, 
something in AWS was misconfigured, maybe we hit a limit, something happened and this security group was not able to be created, it would actually unwind itself and go through this hash map backwards and undo all of the action that it had taken earlier. So Kubecorn does not give you a guarantee that your cluster will come up, but it does, however, give you a guarantee that says, as a, as a user and someone crafting these complex infrastructure maps, I know that I will only create infrastructure pass fail. Either you're gonna create all of it or you're gonna create none of it. So it's actually kind of fun to watch when you're developing, which is when I usually do something wrong and one of these API requests will fail, to actually just watch it undo itself, which is great because after it undoes itself, I can just rerun the command over again and it makes development much quicker and much easier for me. Um, so we go through and it just creates these resources and it maps them together. And eventually it'll get to a point where we need to look up an IP address of the master. So that's what this sort of loop does here. And it'll, it'll actually hang and wait for the API, to, the Kubernetes API to come up. And after that comes up, we can actually find the, um, the address of the, the master instance. And then we can plug that into the launch configuration of our nodes and actually create our cluster that way. So here you see it hanging again. And after it finally comes up, it'll write our cube config and you see it wrote here. Um, users Chris cube slash config. And now I can, I can get my nodes and I have one master up and running. I can even take this command and I can SSH directly into one of these clusters. Notice we're running on Ubuntu here, and this is good old regular Ubuntu. There's nothing fancy about this AMI. If you go and you look in the bootstrap script here, actually, I'm trying to think where I define it. It's here in the launch configuration, which would mean would be defined here in the profile. Um, you can actually go and look at the CMI and it's just Ubuntu 16.04. So I'm encouraging people to use different operating systems. I want people to use op different operating systems. I want there to be a profile for CoreOS. I want there to be a profile for Ubuntu. I want there to be Joe and Sally's Ubuntu profiles because these are sort of what we're representing our cluster with. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, like we could probably even host these profiles in a Git repo somewhere and just have all of these wonderful examples of running Kubernetes in different ways, which is what I think we want. At least that's what I want. So here we're on our, our instance and we can actually see KubeADM was able to bootstrap Kubernetes for us out of the box. We just created this and Kubernetes is up and running. We can go to vardlib and we can go into this cloud directory and then instance and scripts and we can actually see this is our bootstrap scripts that we looked at directly in our repository and you can see the token we defined in our profile is here we're running on port 443 the app get stuff we talked about earlier is all defined here we start up docker we enable docker and and we're done we can actually go to good old var log and we can cat out the, the output here. And these are cube config, or I'm sorry, cube ADM logs. We run our pre-flight checks. We reset our cube ADM installation. Um, we generate our TLS certif certificates for the Kubernetes API. And we ultimately bootstrap the, the Kubernetes control plane and write the cube config out to this. And you, you, your Kubernetes master has this initialized successfully. And that's what we want. Um, so with that being said, we can go through and we can now reverse walk through the list with a delete command. We'll give it the name of our cluster again, which is tech in talk. And we will turn the logs up for folks at home. And we can now watch it actually go through and iterate through the list in reverse and delete all of these resources we uh we, we just created um the the one thing i wanted to point out now that the the, the demo is complete and we're actually watching it delete 
is, is this, this reconciler interface. If I could just get a few minutes and go through that, I think it's important for folks at home to, to understand the simplicity of it while we wait for um, the delete to go through. Um, delete is not quite as asynchronous as the init because you have to delete things in order because of dependencies. So this will actually take on the order of 60 to 80 seconds to complete. But we'll come back and check on it later. So if you go into the GitHub repository here and go into the cloud directory, I have actually, I value and really, really am proud of this interface so much uh, that I went through and wrote, wrote up this documentation, but I would like to just go through it and point out how this pattern works and how it's designed to, to work well with a user and how it could potentially be vendored into a pod and used as uh, the underlying library of an operator for infrastructure, which is really exciting. Um, so the first thing we have is we have init. And what init does is it's like all of the housekeeping things that need to happen in order for us to start communicating with the cloud. So like, let's off with the SDK, let's create a simple hello world um, transaction between the, the program and the, the cloud API. Let's set some defaults in memory and do some other things and basically get the, the reconciler ready to go. We have this, this method called get actual, which will return um, the actual state of your infrastructure in reference to a single Kubernetes cluster. Um, this is really powerful because look at what it's returning. It's returning the cluster API. It's not returning cloud resources. So Git Actual will actually go and audit your infrastructure and return this super valuable cluster representation that is cloud agnostic. So we're, this is where we're actually taking resources in the cloud, mapping them to the API, and returning what's really there in real life. Get Expected says, you gave me a profile. I'm going to now marshal that into an API. And that's what I expect. So you could, when you init the reconciler here, you could actually go through and define whatever expected API you wanted. You could calculate that um, using another program and change the code using Go. You could do it through YAML in the state store and actually edit it up in your favorite text editor of choice, Emacs. Or you could um, get that from any number of other, other places that, that you wanted to if you were writing one of these new operator pods. Then we have reconciler, and this takes what's actually there and takes what you want to be there and reconciles the two. Kubicorn has a guarantee that this return value here is always going to match what get expected will return here. And if it doesn't, it will unwind itself and treat that as any other failure and delete the, uh, the cluster before it, uh, it goes back to stack and, and makes makes any any changes in the cloud. So um, the last one here is destroy, which is effectively the opposite of reconcile. It just goes through the list backwards and will delete everything. Um, so I really hope that people kind of see this and shake their head and go, yes, this makes sense to me. It's very simple. Chris, you've been talking about it way too much. I, I kind of got it within the first two or three seconds of looking at it, which is, which is what we want, um, honestly, because I want it to be easy for people to implement their cloud. I want people to start sharing their cloud infrastructure. I want somebody to be able to come in and say, I want to run this in my cloud of my choice, and I want to be able to change the implementation a little bit. The whole point of this project is that everything is behind an interface with strict contracts and guarantees. It's a framework. It's not a tool. Um, so if you actually go and look, I'm you know, in my free time coding up this digital ocean pull request, and it's, I think it's like five or six files. Like, it's not rocket, it's seven files. And I bet one of them is a huge readme. Uh, it's not a lot of code. And it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of exciting to, to be able to think like, wow, in a weekend I can code a cloud implementation for Kubernetes. And I can go into the bootstrap directory and start changing shell scripts and tinkering with my, with my cloud. And I, all of the boilerplate and all of the, uh, the noise of, of interacting with that and making that into a runnable program is kind of taken care of at this point. So again, I, I really hope people start looking at Cubicorn as a framework and experimenting with it and understanding that this is uh, infrastructure 
and the software level that's in place to empower users to, to run on different clouds, to bring people together and to give you a starting point for solving and dealing with this, this infrastructure layer that is so critical to, to working with Kubernetes. Wow. All I'm going to say is wow. Um, I, I wish I'd been at GopherCon and to see the looks on the faces of people when you demoed this live um, there as well. And, and thank you for dealing with our, our little technical glitch there on the sound. Um, I, I owe you. My dog says the same. But um, just new dog. Um, I, there, I don't even really know where to start. There are so many really cool features in this that, um, like, right from the unicorn to the color coding in the log files to, um, you know, just the simplicity of the whole thing is just really amazing. Um, I think one of the, the best things uh, is the delete of a Kubernetes cluster, the cleanup that you do, and the realization of how important that is. But the thing that um, caught my attention at the very beginning um, was, and I come from an IT audit background many years ago, so the, the ability to run um, and get the state store and get all the information about a cluster, um, and then, you know, of course, reapplying it. But as you can tell, I'm a little excited about this, and so is my dog. Um, and, and I think that uh, he's got a lot to say, I have to say. Hey, Monty. Is somebody moving stuff upstairs. Um, yeah. We might edit that out too, but maybe not. Um, so the question I had um, at the beginning too was a little bit about, you mentioned COPS and COPS is a project underneath Kubernetes already. Um, this is outside of the Kubernetes repo. Um, wh where do you see this going? Um, is this something that the CNCF might take on at some point and adopt or is this really just about um, experimenting and pushing kube admin um, beyond where do you where do you, you you keep saying it's not ready for production yet but then I'm like okay wait wait a minute um, so where do you see this going next I I, I, think, I think oh I'm getting oh, go um, let me turn my my headphones down I think for me the 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 fundamental thing this is solving is like I can kind of take ownership of it and kind of do things my way. Um, and for me, what what's important is empowering people and developing unopinionated frameworks that people can interface with and plug into. So I I would like for people to use it. I, I I'm not working on this thing full time. Like this is not my day job. This is just like Chris Nova on the side. Um, but if, if it does gain momentum, I would love to see it turn into a, a widely used and adopted project. I am, I think it would be great if we could mainstream it, if that was necessary, and get it into Kubernetes core through the incubation process. But I am going to apply the same level of interrogation to my code that I would apply to the politics behind this project, which is, you know, what are we really gaining and what is, what, what so, you know, special about getting something into github.com slash Kubernetes. Um, is that really going to offer anything more than just it's going to be owned and operated by the CNCF, which I'm totally cool with. It would be an honor. I think that would be great. Um, I just, you know, we'll cross that bridge when it comes. For today, I, I want people using kubeadm. I think it's ready. I don't care what the readme says. And I think the only way it's ever going to get better is by doing something like this, by having this infrastructure in place that will actually get people up and running with KubeADM. And I think once it sort of is in this widely adopted space of things where you and I can go and download the program and run a cluster and interact with the, the, the bash script that bootstraps the cluster and actually see and feel and play with it, I think it's really gonna help harden the project and ultimately create a, a vendor for it, right? Like, if people are asking for features and I'm pointing them over to the cube ADM folks and said cluster lifecycle, like, I'm really sorry for doing that guys, but I want, I love this idea. I want people using it. I want it to get better. So maybe I'm doing a little bit of that as well. Um, you know, I think always poking a stick in the fire is a good thing. And um, I think on all of the open source projects, you know, whether they're under the cube repo or on the side, I mean, Kubernetes has got a 
pretty good structure for incubating and doing that. But but the key, I think, to anybody's success, especially to get Cube um, ADM up there and out there and, and adopted in production, is is getting that feedback. And I think what you're doing is, is awesome. But it's also exposing um, people to new patterns and simplifying the, the approach that we have to creating these clusters and managing them. So um, kudos to you for getting it done um, and spending all of your Saturdays doing this, um, and including creating the great unicorn graphic there. Um, we, we do love that. And uh, I, the, uh, the other thing that I was going to ask you, and we've, we've taken up most of your morning to already now, um, this, this is one great project. Next week, we have um, Liz Rice from Aquasec is going to be talking about um, Kube, Kube Bench, another project um, that she's been working on the side around benchmarking for Kubernetes, which is equally awesome, I'm sure. Um, and I'll learn all about it next week. But I'm also interested in, in this space, um, other people that you think we should hear from. Um, and, and before you go, I'm going to remind you to put up your, re your, your last slide again so people know where that repo is. Um, but before you answer, before you leave me this morning, who else do you think we should be talking to and um, is doing new and interesting things out there? I would say um, there is a, a really great person that I've been, I've had the honor of meeting twice now, once at GopherCon and, and once up in Seattle. And, and every time I meet with her, I, I learn something and I sort of uh, I get inspired a bit to go and, and work and, and do these open source things on the weekend. So I would say if you could track down Tiffany Jernigan, actually, from Amazon, she would be a great person to talk to. Yeah, heard good things. Uh, I think I've seen one talk by her um, as well previously. So that, that's actually a really good suggestion. Um, awesome. Chris, as always, it's wonderful to see you, to hear from you. Um, thanks for your patience with our process today. I owe you a microphone, um, and uh, we will see you again. Uh, we will be together at KubeCon um, for sure in December, hopefully between now and then and sooner on other events. But um, KubeCon's coming up, and we're hosting another OpenShift Commons gathering in Austin on December 5th. And Chris um, has, has been invited to be on the Upstream This panel, in which we'll be talking about you know, issues like bringing up new projects um, in through KubeCon and others and how we all collaborate and connect together. So um, I, I wish you great success with this. I know there are people at Red Hat, Michael Hassenglas and others who are very excited about this project. So I'm sure you'll see a few of um, our Red Hatters making pull requests and, and having conversations on Slack. I think you also said that you had created a, a Slack channel or an IRC channel for Kube. Kubicorn or cubic corn or however you want to say it. it is it uh, Slack yeah. or IRC that you created it on? It's uh it's Slack. It's the Gophers Slack. Um, there's a channel in there called Cubic O R N. Um, no. and I think I think there's ten of us, which I was like so proud. I was like, wow, there's ten people who are interested in this this project. That's so exciting. Um, so so we all hang out in there, and and I'm. I'm pretty much always available. If I'm not, I'll, I'll usually just send a message that says like, hey, I'm walking the dog. I'll you know, be back in 20 minutes or whatever. All um, right. So would love okay. to see people there. Well, perfect. Um, thank you very much for doing this. Um, you know, we, we had uh, many more than 10 on the call earlier until we had our technical glitch there. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of interest in this. And, and um, I look forward to having you back on again on whatever the next project is. and. Um, that you're working on and learn more about what you're doing over at Microsoft sometime in the future as well. All right. Take care. Awesome. Thank you.